second. There we go. So, Sam, do we see that okay? Yes. All right, hold on a second. Let me just fix up one more second. Now, I don't know why that's coming. Oh, wait, hold on. Nope, okay. All right, so sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again today. Um, I am Miriam Duchesne. I'm the managing partner of a lot workforce solutions. And um, today we're going to talk more about the actual hiring, onboarding and engagement side of the talent acquisition process. So we've talked about, you know, structuring and, you know, providing a good candidate experience. We talked about how to create messaging to get people interested in your company. And so today we're going to talk about um, the actual hiring piece of it, the onboarding and engagement side of it. So um, again, as Sam mentioned, I prefer interruptions during the presentation. It makes me feel like someone is listening. Um, but if you, you know, have any questions, either type them in and, and Sam can interrupt me or I'd love to talk with you as well. So you've gone through the interview process and you have you think you've made your selection or you've narrowed down your list of candidates to um, perhaps one, two or maybe three. Hopefully you have it down to one or two because then it makes it a lot easier to make sure you've done your due diligence and you have to do due diligence on multiple people for really no reason. So the first thing I want to talk about is references are still alive and well. And I know a lot of people seem to have moved away from this, or at least in my experience, I know oftentimes um, references can just be a big question mark or are they real? Do they, you know, are they really helpful at all, et cetera? Or we're we just going to get an employment verification. And there is a difference between an employment verification and an actual reference. So for um, just a quick overview obviously employment verification is exactly how it sounds in case you're not in, uh, familiar it's just saying yes this person said i worked at this company you're verifying that he or she did not lie and you get very little information other than the fact that they worked there perhaps you can verify dates of employment and title usually you don't get any more information from that but i will share with you that references are still alive and well and um, and can provide some great insight if done properly. So of course there is the old school way of doing references. You could you know get a list of references and start making phone calls to people um, and try to get information or insight into a candidate that you're considering. I don't know about you, but people barely answer the phone these days. Maybe it's because I'm more of in a sales role, but um, we sometimes find it's easier if we automate the process and actually use a third party software to be able to help with that. And so um, there's a lot of tools on the market. There's a lot of automation software related to references. We chose one that's called Checked Reference. And the nice thing about Checked Reference was it's actually originated and developed by a local organization in partnership with SUNY Research Foundation. So um, I think that's helpful because it, it, it gives you a little bit more insight in terms of this isn't just a software that was put together willy nilly. It was there was a lot of it actually took like five years to develop. And there was a lot of research and a lot of information put into it. So checked reference is a way to automate references. It's also a way to get more than just that typical employment reference. And so we all know the typical employment reference, you know, yeah, the person worked here. Oh, yeah, they're a great guy. Oh, yeah, they came to work every day, always did their job well, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in most cases, when people are um, leaving positions, moving on to other positions, sometimes it's for um, actual career progression. So they may not have actually performed in that role before. They might have relevant experience, but we really don't know if they're going to be successful in the new role, which is why we use checked reference, because this tool actually helps us determine not only to get a nice um, employment reference on people, but it also helps to determine um, their ability to actually be successful in the role that you're considering. 
So, and I'll show you actually an example of a report just so you can get a little bit of insight into it. And again, if anyone's interested in more in the tool offline, but the reason I'm sharing this is because there is ways to use a reference to actually help you make your final decision when you're hiring someone for a role. And, um, and the reason that this is, is so powerful is because the five years of research went into investigating and determining characteristics and attributes that will make people successful in particular jobs. So when we present an employment reference to someone who's been listed as a reference, if they're applying for a sales position, the questions and the information gathered is going to be different than if say they were a programmer looking for a position or someone in HR or operations or whatever it might be. And that's what's key. It's more of a, conf it, well, it is a confidential survey tool that also allows for open-ended questions and additional information. So I'm just gonna hopefully pop over to my other screen. I'm hoping you guys can see it. It should say, Alant look like a bunch of dots and says introduction. Sam, can you see that? Is that there? Yep, that's visible. Okay. Great, awesome, very good. So I'm sharing with you actually a gentleman who works in my team. This is, um, I have his permission to share it. I mean, he'd share it anyway, because you can see his overall score is a, a highest potential for a sales manager position with our organization. And so as you can see, I'm gonna, just going to scroll kind of through really quickly. It, it, it talks about a lot of things. And you can see on the top some of the um, areas that are important that we grade for a sales management type position are listed here. And so this information has been gathered basically throughout the process of us checking references. And um, it, it's a it's a combination of a kind of a mini personality assessment that the applicant takes in addition to the survey questions that are asked of all of the different references. And then they're like charted for us so you can actually see what the potential is. Um, had I thought ahead of time, I would have showed you a bad one because uh, highest potential obviously is a great score. And then as the if you go to the left of all of those check mark boxes with the circle where the overall score is. Whereas like right here where my cursor is circling, um, obviously the less boxes, the less boxes that are checked off kind of will, well, it does indicate that the person may not be suitable for the role. And so it goes from lowest potential to acceptable to potential to high potential. So you can kind of get an understanding of it. And this is mostly done via email and survey links. And so the applicant actually fills out the information the references, the reference links are sent to all of the um, people the person put as a reference. They have an opportunity to fill out a confidential survey. It, col it collects all the information and gives us this reference report. And the reason that I'm sharing that with you is because it, it is important to have good references on people. And again, we can use this tool to not only indicate uh, you would think everybody would put good references down, but surprisingly enough, um, or maybe not to you, I find there are people out there that don't even realize that the references are not saying the best things about them. Um, or in other regards, um, oftentimes we can get some insight into how quickly references are completed on an applicant and or if they're not completed on an applicant. So that can give you some um, suggested insight into an applicant that you might not be able to get if you were to make a phone call. And obviously making phone calls and doing telephone tag and all of those things can just take a really long time. So if you can um, invest in an analytical reference tool like a check reference or something like that, that would probably be a great investment for you and your organization. Anecdotally, I share a couple of different stories and, and when we devised, you know, brought this tool into our fold in terms of um, our toolbox in terms of other things that we use to make sure that we're great, finding great candidates. I had an organization that worked with me. I shared with them our checked reference tool and that we use it. And um, I said, we pull candidates. If, they, if, they, if the references come back and it shows that they're not a strong fit, even though the references may say good things, you have to look at the, the data and the statistics around all of the competencies because someone may be very well liked, but they just might not be capable of doing that job. And so we had a candidate a couple of years ago for a software company. They um, we did the references. They liked the candidate a lot. 
we actually recommended that they not hire the candidate because of the results that we received on the references. Um, the client opted to bypass that and, and disregard the references that we presented and hired the individual anyway. And within a month, I was refilling the position. So that's just one of a couple of stories that I have of, of pretty much how good this tool is. But um, it does a couple of things. It automates the process for you. And if you're in a small organization where you have few hands doing many tasks, um, it's definitely something that it can help speed up your selection process and make sure you're getting the very best candidate in the door. Um, I would recommend that you do air education verifications. You can either use a third party or a service to do this. We use something called Student Clearinghouse. It's the quickest, cheapest way to verify degrees. People are still lying when it comes to education. We actually literally this past week had a candidate who said that they had a bachelor's degree at a certain college listed on their resume. The person would, went through all of our checks went through all of our due diligence. He got the hire, he got the offer. We started the background check and it was discovered very quickly that um, he was um, not telling us the truth and, um, and then effectively ghosted us. So obviously the candidate was hiding something, but I would recommend that if, if, if you're looking at an entire candidate, make sure you look at everything they tell you, everything they say, verify all of it because any little piece can be an indicator of their integrity, their ethics, and those types of things. If you have a question, Miriam. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's just a simple question. Um, <laughs> can you provide the website to the checked reference? Absolutely. Yes, I can. It's actually, I believe, check.com spelled the way it looks on there, but I can provide that. Um, I don't know if I can do it while I'm presenting, but I can, look it up. I can I can do that. It's check oh, reference, okay, just like how it's spelled on your slides. Pretty much. Yes, it is either checked reference or just checked. It might just be the word checked.com. Okay, I'll look that up for the audience. Thank you. And then just as a side note, we um, love this tool so much. We did become an authorized reseller. So if someone wanted a demo or more information about it, um, I'd be happy to provide that at a, a later date as well. So just as a side note, if someone is interested in looking into the tool, I have to tell you from a, a an employment agency perspective, Recruiters kind of um, sometimes can have reputations and I try to do everything I possibly can to make sure that the reputation of a lot, the work that we do for our clients is completely everything we say it's going to be. And so when we implemented this tool within our organization, um, I, I told my recruiters, you know, we do a lot of what we're, you know, screening and recruiting kind of based on our gut feel. And so, most times we're right, but sometimes we're wrong. And this, this tool has actually helped us be able to give that much more insight into a candidate for our clients so that we know that the placement will be successful and they'll have, a, you know, an opportunity to have a long career with that employer. And um, it really has increased our ability to make sure our retention rates are almost 100% with placements that we make because of this tool, because it is so impactful in helping us make decisions on candidates. So jumping forward, um, skill testing, I think it's gonna depend on the type of candidates and the type of work that you're doing. I see two types of skills testing that happen more frequently, but I'll go over a couple of different ones as well. So the most frequent is, um, in administrative support type positions, positions in which people need to use Microsoft Office products or Adobe products or whatever it might be um, in day-to-day -day activities related to their job. So those are hard skills. And so there's there's sites out there um, that can test those things. And then they're usually benchmarked against averages from other people taking the test within your organization or just within the system um, as a whole if you don't have a lot of benchmarks for your company. The other type of testing I see oftentimes is with software companies and they're they're testing people for the skill sets that they need for the different programming jobs or different things that they're hiring within their organization. Oftentimes I find that those organizations create their own tests, which is fantastic. The only thing I would caution is you should make sure that your tests have been validated by someone who is an expert in that because you don't want to ever be in a position in which that could come back to be a risk that you didn't mitigate 
because there was a discriminatory practice, a question, whatever it might be. And I know when it's like, well, it's just, you know, a programming test, you'd be surprised. So I would say definitely um, make sure that your tests are compliant or find someone that can help you um, do that or just look to a third party who's already done all of those things for you. Generally, they're not that expensive. Um, obviously, we use it within our organization and the cost is, is very inexpensive for um, unlimited testing for a year's subscription. I honestly think it's like around $1,000 a year, which is not that much money given the course of, um, you know, if you break it out monthly or per candidate, which in our case obviously is a steal. So um, there's obviously soft skill tests as well. The system we use does things like customer service mindset. So it gives you a bunch of questions that say, hey, you know, what would this person do in this scenario? And they'll give you a scenario. And then the applicant who's taking the test has to like pick the correct answer of how to handle a situation. But there's all sorts of tests like um, judgment and management and whatever it might be. So you could also just, you know, use a disc or um, something related to that. Checked itself actually has a disc related tool that's part of their package. We don't use it because we feel that the reference tool, tool is kind of like an all-in-one for us. It's probably a little bit more narrowly focused, but Checked actually does have those, um, those types of assessments available as well. I just don't, I'll be honest, I just don't know enough about it. I would also make sure you don't over-test. So, you know, determine what are the best tests for this job to make sure you're getting the right person for the position. My recommendation would be try to do three or less tests if possible. And um, again, make sure you're doing them at the right time. So sometimes it's a matter of practice and a matter of taste, honestly. Um, I prefer not to do testing until I have interviewed a candidate and established a rapport with them and know that they're interested in whatever opportunity I, opportunity I have for them or working with a land. Sometimes companies do testing right up front, even before they even have a first round interview or an initial screening. And um, I, I don't recommend it at that point. I understand why companies do it. They're trying to basically weed out people so that they can get a smaller talent pool. But um, I don't I don't prefer that because I prefer to see someone's overall experience. And frankly, if you're paying per test, which I don't know how many systems are like that, but there used to be um, systems like that, you might be wasting money for no reason because after you interview them, you're like, yeah, they're not going to be a fit for our organization and you don't have to do all of those things. So I would recommend some type of assessment. Most people are very um, accustomed to having assessments now if they're applying for jobs. So don't I wouldn't be nervous about using them or hesitant at all about using them. I would just be very careful. So criminal and background investigation. So there's a couple of things in this area that I, I really want to talk about because um, as you'll see with my first checkbox, it says select the right firm, you get what you pay for. And I will tell you that's absolutely the case. There are a lot of online or quicker services out there that offer lower costs to um, do background checks on employees. And the reason that they're doing that is because they are only hitting databases. So they're pinging a database, seeing if anything comes up in it, and that cost is, is fairly um, reasonable, frankly. But what I will share with you is if an investigation firm is doing their due diligence, you're paying for statutory fees, which is the cost of the databases and then going to the municipalities and, and gathering information. And you also have to pay for that service. And so a solid background check for someone should cost you in the neighborhood of at least $100, depending upon what you're checking. And you will see online lots of options for $39.99 or $24.99, or I'm telling you, they're not actually doing what you think they are doing. And so that's why if you're going to do criminal background investigations, use a reputable provider. There's a few here in the capital region that I would recommend to you when I have a longstanding relationship, which is our render of choice. But there's another one also in the area that's very strong. So um, make sure you understand that, because if you just, you know, go and, and pick a, a a service that's just charging you like a flat rate for every background check, you're not really getting stuff checked. And so that's very important. And the other thing with the criminal background investigations is determine when you're going to do it. So um, typically the best practice is you make a verbal offer to a candidate, 
you make their offer contingent upon successful background check so that you can kind of begin the process of getting that person in your fold onboarded those types of things and then the criminal background check does the company does their work and you get the information generally within a couple of days sometimes if someone's lived in um overseas or they've had multiple addresses that's something that could be more of an issue and take a little bit longer and frankly cost a little bit more but um it, you'll get your options and your ability to do that so usually when you do a background check it's usually back within three business days and background check companies can do things like employment verifications they're not doing references they're doing employment verifications they do education verifications they can do a whole slew of things which leads me into my next um item which says don't google your candidates so i know everybody's done it um you get a candidate you get a resume the first thing you do is probably go to linkedin and look up the candidate's profile perhaps see their picture those types of things um other organizations or you may do this too you may just go on google and type the person's name in and see what hits i would say word of caution to that be very careful because you don't necessarily know if that's the right person that you actually found the information on you could find information from social media posts and other things that um, could affect your hiring decisions, which are not legal. So you could be looking at stuff that's going to blur your judgment, but frankly, you shouldn't know those things and they shouldn't be part of your hiring decision. So you have to be very careful with that. And um, background check companies are now doing things to help organizations such as you know, for lack of a better word, Googling your candidates for you or doing social media checks for you, where depending upon what you want checked and what would be concerning to your organization, they can flag things like, you know, what types of, not necessarily what types of content they're liking, but what posts that they might be putting up, if they're anything that's, you know, racist or, you know, promotes violence or violence against people or, um, you know, inappropriate sexuality type posts, things like that. Um, uh, I would rather have the professionals do it for me so that I can, um, one, I have more time to do other things, but two, I don't want to be judging somebody um, unfairly if that's one, not even the right person, and two, to have to deal with like learning stuff that I might not want to really know about a candidate. So um, I would recommend that you definitely leave that to the pros and um, and then it's just going to, it's going to cover you and um, and keep just your whole process very, very, um, very consistent and very, you're, you're mitigating all of your risk. Um, the other thing I just remembered I wanted to mention regarding skills testing is if you are testing one person, test all people for the same job. So say, for example, use accounting as an example. If you test all of, you know, you test all of your accounting candidates for a certain skill, make sure you test all of your candidates that you're considering for hire for that skill don't pick and choose um, that can get you into a lot of trouble another discriminatory practice and um, just make sure your process is documented and consistent across the board this is when we do references this is when we do education this is when we do skills testing this is when we do criminal background checks and follow your process every time and be consistent across the board all right so um, so you've done all of your due diligence and you've made your selection on your candidate. And so you're going to give them the job offer. Um, so when making the job offer, in my opinion, it is the first, well, it's not the first interaction, but it's the next interaction that's going to make it or break it, getting that person excited about working for your organization. So my recommendation is if at all possible, make it be very personalized and what i mean by that is don't have hr pick up the phone or just someone who's pushing the paper pick up the phone and say here's your job offer or sending email um have the hiring manager the person that made that decision on hiring the person make the outreach to the candidate explain to them why they were selected for the position show emotion and excitement as for them joining your team really get them excited and interested in your opportunity that they want to take the job offer from that first interaction so do a verbal first and then follow up with a formal written one and remember um, if you are in some type of sales uh, if you're hiring for a sales position um, you are required by new york state law to also provide not only an offer letter but a letter or some type of um, incentive compensation 
plan, program, how the person is going to get paid, if they're going to get any type of commissions, incentives, and bonuses based on the work that they do, that has to be signed as well and kept on file and done every year. So even if your salesperson um, works for your company for 10 years and they have the same compensation plan every year, change the dates on it and make them sign it again. So be very careful with that and make sure that they have that information as well. And then once you hire them, there's other paperwork that they have to do, including a wage form. New York State requires a wage form on all employees. So it's different from the offer letter. So you want to make sure that you are complying with all of those intricacies of um, the paperwork and the compliance related to that. Now, here's the one that I wanted to talk the most about. Be mindful of counter offers or competing offers. So let's talk about counter offers first. Um, great rule of thumb is to be talking about counter offers when you're interviewing the candidate. Do not wait until the offer. Ask them when you're interviewing them, why are they looking for a new job? Try to get an indication. Is it really because of career advancement? Do they really just want more money in their current position? Are they just trying to find a way to get more money and not leave their current job? Um, there's any, I, I always recommend just being upfront. Is there anything that the, your current company could do that would convince you to stay? and see how they react to that question or how they answer that question. And then when you give them the offer and they accept the offer, ask them, when are you giving your notice? Do you need any information or can I provide you any information related to you know, the package and everything that we're giving you so that you're basically trying to counter the counter offer and um, have that not be something that a person wants to um, consider. But it happens, and it's happening more now in the last year than I've seen probably in the last five years. People are using, count, uh, using offers to um, try to get more money out of their current employer. So just be very aware of it and ask multiple times throughout the process if um, you know they should be aware of a counter offer, or if they have any offer, other offers on the table, um, they you know might be interviewing at other companies with other positions, and those organizations could potentially be making counter offers to up your offer. So getting that relationship started with the candidate is very very important because you want to establish some loyalty, you want to establish some emotion because then they're going to feel a lot worse about perhaps flipping and going someplace else. So I always make sure that I cover that carefully within our organization and with the companies that we work with. But it's happening a lot. So I just want you to be aware of that. Okay, next. So again, retention starts at the offer. So they've, uh, they've accepted the position. Again, you still have the potential to have a counter offer come at any point during that, basically that whatever notice period they give, two weeks, three weeks, whatever it might be. Um, so what I like to do is once someone says that they want the position and they've accepted the position in my offer, I, well, I wanna send them some type of thing to make them feel good. So it could be, um, it could be you know, sending them some type of welcome packet of information whether it be something related to company swag. Some people do like swag um, baskets with shirts and pens and tchotchkes or whatever it might be. It could be, um, here's all the things you need to know before you start. Maybe here's some homework or some research that you can do so that you can kind of hit the ground running. Don't do too much of that, but just a little bit just to keep them engaged and interested in the organization introduce them to peers that they might not have met during the interview process. And we'll talk about keeping, you know, managers and peers in touch with them as well. So, and then I would recommend that you follow up frequently from the time of offer to the start date, um, making sure that they got the welcome packet. Do you have any questions? Have you thought of anything that I can answer for you before you start? Has anything changed since the last time we talked? Because a lot of times what happens is people will get those counter offers after they've given their notice and after they um, after they've given their notice and before they start with your organization. And so you want to make sure again you're keeping that relationship going so that they feel um, you know more loyal to you and your organization. Um, I would also encourage other managers and peers to be in touch with them and make that new hire feel welcome, whether it's you know sending them an email, having a quick phone call, um, again, the, the, 
the key word here is establishing a relationship with someone so that they are interested and, and feel wanted and welcome and like, you know, they get excited because all of these people want them to be part of their organization, want them to be part of their organization. So I find that that um, makes a big difference in terms of that overall welcoming feel that you can provide people. Um, and then, you know, some organizations I've seen are actually congratulating and welcoming, welcoming people into their company even before they start. I mean, honestly, you could go either way on that. I would be careful with it because I always hate to see things where people maybe be a little bit premature in introducing new employees and then they actually don't start or something happens, whether it be the background check or counter off or whatever it might be. But even if it's um, after they've stepped foot, you know, either virtually or actually into your office, then I would try to get something up pretty quickly, welcoming, welcoming them to the organization and making that announcement. Is there any questions or anything up until this point? Yeah, Mary, I might have a question. Um, yeah. What are the easiest, least expensive ways to hire <laughs> new staff during a trial period? So I don't know if that relates. Maybe that's so more of a, start, a startup reference. For instance, you know, in some startup companies, if you're trying to onboard maybe a new co-founder or a new individual to the team that might be a long-term player, a long-term contributor to the company, like there's a vesting equity schedule. So I don't know if like you had, if, if you had any experience, best practices around, you know, hiring someone on a, on a trial period, quote unquote, but it's more feeling them out to see if they're going to be a good fit long-term. Okay, so I, it depends is the best way I can answer that question. So there, a couple of things are in an employer's favor right now. If you are adding to your team and you meet somebody or want to hire somebody who isn't currently working um, and you want to do some type of contractual or short-term type of temp to perm is really what I call it in my industry where somebody wants to an employer wants to hire somebody, but they want to like make sure it's a good fit on both sides before they make that final commitment. It's a attempt to perm type of a situation. And um, I mean, it's going to depend on the situation. It's going to depend on the person and if they would even want to take that type of job. And so for organizations that might want to do something like that, you would want to have one, a value, value proposition as to why someone would want to consider that. And two, you could be limiting your ability to hire the best person for the job because in most situations, not all, but in most situations, a person isn't going to leave a full-time permanent opportunity to take a contract opportunity. So you may limit your pool because you might only be looking at people that are unemployed that would be open to that. And there's a lot of great talent out there, especially right now that um, because of COVID are in situations where they're going to be much more perhaps likely to take um, a position on a contractual or temporary basis or probationary basis to see if it works. You could just have in your general offer and in your employment practices, a probationary period, which is, you know, in a way, a get out of free jail card for you if you if you really needed that. Um, again, nothing's ever permanent, in my opinion. I've also seen, and it depends on the level of the person, but I've actually seen very high level, very skilled professionals prefer that as well, because it allows both parties to get to know each other better and get to feel each other out. But again, it's going to depend on the situation and um, and why you're really doing it. Did that answer the question? Because you were Sam, you like it sounded like you were reading something. So I wasn't. I heard it was kind of broken up a little bit. So I just want to make sure I actually answered the question. It was a question we got in social media prior to the to the event. Um, okay. I, and I was just trying to maybe translate it and understand what no. <laughs> they were asking. Sure. It seemed like more of a Less corporate process, but maybe more um, startup. Beat. Startup process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, right now, I think startups have an advantage if they want to do stuff like that. Um, I think there's a lot more people that are a little bit more um, 
open and flexible to creative hiring situations. So from that perspective, um, you know, there are a lot of people on the market because of COVID that um, might be more open to that. And, um, you know, even with our organization, if someone's not working, and we have an opportunity that's right up their alley and it's temporary for now. We always encourage people, what, what's it going to hurt? You don't have anything else lined up right now. You can, you know, people know you're still looking for a full-time job, but this is a temporary job. We find in most cases with the organizations that we work with, if they start on a temporary basis, and I always ask, why do you want to hire temporary? And it's usually based on a scenario of we want to just make sure it's the right fit. We have limited, you know, budget, and we just want to make sure that we're not spending money needlessly. And um, oftentimes you can get um, people to take those opportunities. And in my business with the employers we work with, I would say it's like a 90 percent um, turn into conversion rate, turning into a full time job for that organization and that person who gets placed there. So it's definitely an option for both an employer and an employee. Now is a better time to do it because of COVID and the strange economy that we're in. If it was two years ago or even a year ago, and you had asked me that question, we would have to be a little bit more creative because um, it would be harder to find people that would even be interested in that type of opportunity. Okay, next. So onboarding. So onboarding is the next piece of the puzzle. The person did not take a counter offer. They're ready to start with your organization, but this is really important. And I wanted to share just a little bit of information 76% of employees determine within the first six months if they're going to stay with the company. And so a lot of factors play into that. One of the biggest factors is actually because they were not onboarded successfully. And about 43 out of 100 employees leave in the first 90 days. And that's absolutely related to onboarding and training. So this is very important to get it right. Um, but I would also say it's a process that has to, it's always evolving. I feel like everything in this type of business and, and in this type of process for talent acquisition should always be evolving. Something that worked three years ago may not work today. And there might be a new um, way of doing things or a new technology to help automate something. So you always want to keep those things in mind and just always be looking for the things that work best for your organization. And especially if you're in startup mode, it's going to be a little bit of trial and error to get it right. So onboarding is more than just tax forms. Now, you do need the tax forms. You do need the I-9. You do need the wage form. Um, so those things are all very important within onboarding. And I'm not going to go down that road of onboarding. I'm going to go down the road of, in, in my world, the touchy-feely piece of it. Again, building that relationship, that loyalty, that plan to make sure that they are equipped for success. Oftentimes what's, what happens is employees get very frustrated because an organization is in growth mode or startup mode. And while they need people, the other side of the coin is, is they're too busy to train people and onboard them correctly. And so you're just gonna get in this hamster wheel of a cycle of um, you know never having people stay if you just, if you just took a step back got your onboarding kind of in line so that it's a repeatable process once you have it in place. Just take a minute, get it in place, and then you can, you know, use the same process as you go forward. And so, you know, I have an on-site and a virtual version of onboarding. And again, this is just kind of like surface, you know, 50,000 foot overview level of it. And a lot of it is actually still the same with a couple of tweaks. So, you know, if you were going to have somebody start on site within an organization, you want to make sure their desk is configured. You want to make sure their computer equipment is there. And are you ready for them on the first day? Same thing from a virtual perspective. The only difference is, are you going to arrange for them if it's local to come into the organization, pick up their stuff and then leave? Or are you going to make sure you're sending it to them with all of the instructions and all of the things that they need to be ready for the first day? Um, obviously, you want to make sure their company email is set up, their phone is set up. And I bring these things up because, and maybe this isn't um, common sense for everybody. For me, I feel like it's common sense, but you'd be surprised as to how many people or organizations don't have these basic things ready to go. 
And so there should be some type of checklist or process that your company goes through that as soon as someone says yes, you start doing the rest of the stuff to make sure that when they walk on premise or when they're ready to start their first day, if it's remote, that they're ready to go. The next one is really important to me, and I think it's really important to organizations to be able to do this. And that is, and it's on site or virtual, every employee needs a, a buddy or a mentor or someone that they're paired up with. And mentor might not be the great best word for it because that implies more of like a, you know, some type of perhaps hierarchy. And so it's more of a buddy. And so, yes, they're going to have their supervisor. They're going to have their manager that might be leading their training and all of those types of things, but they need someone else. At a minimum, they need one more person that's just someone that works for the company, whether it's in the same department or in the same area, or if your company isn't um, segmented enough to have multiple, depart multiple departments, it needs to be somebody who can kind of be that person that your new employee won't be afraid to ask what they might consider a simple question that they don't want to ask a supervisor. And that does happen. And it's mostly about the culture of the organization, the intricacies of everybody's business and how the, the you know, inner workings of the company or, you know, don't talk to Sally before 10 a.m. because she hasn't had her coffee and she's not awake yet. Or, you know, and I'm, I'm being kind of silly with my example, but those little intricacies and those little cultural things that you don't know about until you get there, are much easier to assimilate into and have a heads up on to make sure you act appropriately. If you have someone that um, can kind of show them the ropes, and I don't mean show them the ropes from the job side of it, I just mean show them the ropes and have somebody that's I know, a friend. I mean, I think of it as like the first day of school and I can relate to it because I, I changed schools in ninth grade in high school, which is probably the worst time to have to change schools. And going into a school where you know no one and you know nothing and you don't know where everything is or how it works. Um, maybe I'm like jaded because of my bad, you know, transferring schools in high school. But for me, that's what I related to. And I get like flashbacks and I, I just hope that people think about that because they don't want other people to feel, you know, scared, inadequate, insecure, anxious, nervous, whatever it might be. So um, obviously, if they're on site, pairing them up with somebody, if they're virtual, it's even more important because when someone starts, if they're starting their job virtually, um, I think you need to have more touch points, more communication points and more opportunities for that person to be included in things, even if it's a little bit of overkill because they are going to be working on an island, so to speak. And so you want to start to establish um, that feeling of being part of the organization as quickly as possible. So having that employee buddy or someone there to help with that is really important. Um, I, I, again, lunch on the first day. So, um, you know, either have a system where maybe the manager takes the team out for lunch and includes that person or it's a one on one. Um, I remember one of my very first job it was my very first job in human resources. My boss took me out to lunch on the first day and I was scared to death. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because she took me off site, we went to a nice restaurant and she was like, OK, here's how I like things, here's how we do things, here's all of the things you should know about the organization. So it was really, really nice for me to hear all of that and learn all of that um, before I really started and dug into the job. So you can still do that virtually. It's gonna be a little different, I know. Um, I would recommend maybe getting some type of, you know, gift card to, you know, DoorDash or Uber Eats or whatever it might be, and then set up some type of virtual lunch, whether it's with the team or that employee slash buddy person that you've aligned the person with. Um, and then you want to have a formal agenda. So my recommendation would be plan out how this person is going to get acclimated to the company and the job for the first week. And the first week is going to be a lot of different stuff. So, and it might be more culture stuff, company stuff, those types of things, but have it written out and have the employee get a copy of it or the new employee get a copy of it so they can kind of follow along and know what to expect and kind of what they need to do. And whether that's, you know, job shadowing um, through, you know, some internal system that you use to keep people engaged, whether it's listening in on meetings or just being a fly on the wall, whatever it might be, but have a formal agenda. 
Um, I always put on the on-site one, the Friday Jeans Day, because um, it, it, it's kind of a hazing in my office from a standpoint of it never fails. The first week someone starts in, on my team, the first week in the office, we always forget to tell them that Friday is Jeans Day because we dress up every day for work when we were working in person. Now we're in blazers and sweatpants, but you know, my time, how times have changed. But little stuff like that to make them feel more included is really important. And, um, and that's why I brought that up on the on-site thing. And there could be something else, you know, maybe there's happy hours that are every other week virtually, or you guys have a trivia thing or whatever it might be to keep people engaged. You just wanna make sure that they're included. And then absolutely have a 30, 60, 90. This again goes back to in 30 days, you will learn these tasks and this is where you should be at in your job. And 60 days, you should hit this milestone. And 90 days, you should hit that milestone. And then break it up and have the employee learn it and then perform it in smaller segments. Doing it virtually is a lot more challenging, I understand, but it can be done. Um, you know, I use the mindset of if you are, I mean, my meetings, I joke about people not being on camera in meetings. And I'm like, if I was in your office meeting with you, I wouldn't have a paper bag over my head. You'd be seeing me in person. It's the same thing. So there are ways to do all of these things. And perhaps you'd have to figure it out for your organization, what makes the most sense. But anything that you would do on site, try to um, translate it to a virtual type of activity if you need to if your organization is virtual or they're they've moved from on-site to virtual or it's a hybrid or you're starting shop and this is how you're going to run your organization from a virtual perspective so those are the types of things that you have to keep in common or keep at top of mind also remember um and i think you everybody has felt this you know i've heard the term zoom fatigue i've heard the term you know, just so much screen time. It's so much more screen time. I laugh because I have an iPad that's like my personal thing. And I don't I don't know if you guys have this or see this, but it says your screen time is up or down for the week. And it'll give you like this a little analysis of how much screen time. And my iPad hardly has any screen time at all. So it always tells me I'm like, you know, very little screen time. I'm like, yeah, BS. I do 10 hours of screen time because all I do is like interface with my computer and people on the other end of it. So, but the reason I bring that up is because you want to potentially segment or chunk out all of the stuff that the person might need to learn um, for two reasons. One, it's going to be easier for the, the new employee, but it's also going to be easier for your current employees or whoever's in charge of onboarding or training, whatever it might be. So if there's a way to create more short videos to cover materials, perhaps they're even things that, you know, someone can just, the new employee can just log in and they don't have to be interacting with someone else so that the person who might be in charge of their training can maybe get something else done for an hour. If they say, okay, here's like four videos on different topics, go look at these and then let me know when you're done kind of a thing. Um, also, you could, oftentimes I find onboarding and training sometimes happen more with like a manager or an HR person. HR person does the compliance pieces of it and then the manager does, okay, the 30, 60, 90, those types of things. If you're moving to a virtual environment and you could do this in person too, um, perhaps you enlist other people on your team, senior, senior members of your team. Maybe they're not supervisors, but they're you know people that have been with your organization or your department so that you can kind of break up and um, task out all of the training and onboarding duties so that one person isn't tasked with all of it. And then if you do have it so that eventually you are going to go back to the office, um, you know, try to do a virtual tour of the office, try to get something recorded that you have available that you can just, you know, use again and again and again. I was on a networking call the other day and I was laughing because an individual just got a new job and he had been looking for a few months and he was joking about how he'd never been to his office and he'd never seen what his view was from his office window. And someone else that did business with that company was like, oh, I know where your office is going to be. You have a view of the parking lot. But that's the type of stuff that, you know, people are still curious to know about. And it'll also just give them a little bit more sense of feeling um, like what to expect if they are ever um, required to go back to the office. So, okay. Oh. Hold on a second, did I miss something? Might have a slide out of order, so I apologize. But I guess what's important is, um, I'm gonna skip this slide and possibly go back to it because this is in a wrong spot, so I apologize. I made some last minute changes to my 
presentation this morning as I was reviewing it. And so I, I think I have something out of order. So my apologies. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is the engagement side of the, um, the coin. So onboarding is important. Making the offer and all the due diligence is important. You know, frankly, every piece of the puzzle is important. And so, you know, making sure that you have a system that um, is set up, documented, repeatable, and consistent will go a long way to help you make sure that every employee you bring into your organization has the same experience. And engagement is a very important part of this. So once someone is into your company, and obviously the engagement started with the onboarding, if you do all the little things to make that person really feel welcome, you are 10 steps ahead of most people and most organizations that um, may neglect to do these types of things. And so what's really important, though, is um, on this slide, obviously, some more statistics and um, 35% of employees will leave their job each year by 2023 to go to work someplace else. And when those employees are surveyed, 77% of them said the reason they quit is they could have, it could have been prevented by the employer. So there's a lot of different reasons. They're related to everything we've already talked about and then some that I'm just gonna cover really quickly. Um, but the point of this is employers can do a lot to make or break how the employee feels about their experience within the organization. And to the best of your ability, especially if you're a smaller company or a startup, it can be really exciting, but can also be a lot of work. And so you want to make sure you set the stage, but also be mindful of your employees' needs so that you can keep them long-term instead of having to spend time and money to consistently refill positions because people just leave because they're not happy. So it's really important. So um, I had like a big slide in here that like had all these different things and I boiled it down to the top three reason people leave organizations, which go back to engagement and basically having people know where they stand within the organization. So career pathing and development is very, very key. Um, Work-life balance is another one that's very popular. And this was before COVID, um, this um, data came out. And then obviously the ability to trust, interact, and feel good about their leadership and management within an organization. And I'm sure you've heard the saying, people don't leave jobs or companies, they leave managers. And that absolutely is the case. So for career pathing and development, I think um, it's important to make sure I stress that, and this again, could be common knowledge, but I find it's not for many people I talk to. Not everybody wants like that career progression that's going to, you know, go from, I'll use, you know, just a silly example of, you know, administrative assistant to CEO. Many want opportunities for growth, opportunities for learning, opportunities to make more money, but not necessarily do they just want to move into a manager type of role. So the best way to develop a good career path and development is to work with employees one on one, discuss what they want, and then try to help map it out so they can see where they are, what they need to do to get to where they want to go. And even small companies can have pathways. Um, honesty is the best policy. So if someone comes to you and says they want ABC job and that is never going to exist in your organization or the person who has that job just happens to be the owner of the company. So the chances of them ever being able to do that job are probably very slim. Be honest with people, but then talk about, well, if you're interested in this, what if we talked about this type of opportunity or this type of growth? Here's what it could look like for our organization. Again, it's that one-on-one -on -one that's talking to an employee, that's understanding what they need or want to be successful and happy within your company, and then seeing how you can make it work. So you want to review that frequently with employees. You want to ask for feedback. The other thing that I um, I I'm a big proponent of, and it's sometimes very hard to do, but I want to share it just in case you might be of the same mindset or um, have the opportunity to do it. Try to create a, a culture of advancement, but also allowing for retraction. So if, you know, I, I call it not up or out, but up or down. And what I mean by that is sometimes people want to have some type of career pathway, career leadership or development or career ladder type of growth. But 
sometimes they're just not successful for a number of reasons. That could be a whole other discussion for another day. And what often happens, probably 99% of the time, what happens is, is if they're not successful in the new job that they're in, unfortunately, they have to leave the organization. And um, I know of a company around here who has a culture of, you can be promoted into this new job. We're going to give you six months a year to acclimate to the new job. Make sure it's what you thought it was. Make sure you're performing at the level that we want you to perform at. But if for some reason, if you were performing great at that other job, and if for some reason it's not a good fit for you for whatever reason, you have the opportunity to step back into the, the other position and resume employment that way instead of up and out. And it's not for all companies, but if there's a way that you can do it within your organization, holy cow, the engagement, the loyalty, and the sense of ownership people are going to have with you and your company, it's off the charts. So um, it just, keep that in mind if there's a way for you to do it. Now, you may be saying, well, what about the other job that they just left? Well, in that situation, they either bring in a temp or a contractor or somebody to cover that workflow until the person, you know, successfully transitions into the other job. And then pathways don't have to be budget busting. A lot of times people think career pathing and development has to be investing a lot of money in schooling or certifications or whatever it might be. And there's a lot of time within organizations where it can be special projects, it can be job shadowing, it can be mentorship programs, it can be setting up people to work in different departments and learn about different areas of the company. So you can be very creative in this to give people just not only exposure to other areas of your company, but you know every opportunity should be a learning opportunity and hopefully your employees see it that way. So work-life balance is a little bit harder of one and I recognize that sometimes within organizations that are startup organizations, the work-life balance is going to be much more difficult because of the nature of the work. Again, as I had said before, few hands, many tasks instead of the other way around. And so I think the best thing to do for you and your organization when it comes to work-life balance, whatever it is, is to make sure you're transparent on the expectations of the role when the person is interviewing for the job, again, when they start the onboarding, all of those things, that they understand what are the expectations of this job? Is there travel? Is there, you're gonna have to work 50 hours a week? Have to, you know, sometimes you're gonna have to be on call, whatever it might be. Just be transparent and upfront because I tell organizations, you should be selling people out of the job rather than into the job. If you have to sugarcoat something, then you're not gonna get the right person to take that job. And as painful as it may feel that that person's the right person for the job, but their priorities and your priorities aren't in alignment, it's not gonna work out. So it's better to just say, this is the job, here's what's expected, et cetera. And again, that kind of falls into also, what's the culture and the expectations of the organization? Are you an organization that promotes work-life balance? Are you an organization that's kind of more nose to the grind? got to pound, 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 because we're, you know, got to hit this number, hit this goal, hit this quota, whatever it might be. And, um, you know, some people really like that and want to work in that type of organization. And some people are not going to, are not going to thrive in that, in that situation. So, and work-life balance doesn't necessarily always mean work-life balance. So it depends, everybody has a different um, understanding of that or their own description of that. So again, what I would do and what I do with my employees, and this is just personally uh, as a business owner and someone who hires for their organization, I sit down with them and I ask them, you know, what does work-life balance mean to you? Describe that to me. And I start to get a feel for, and I do that during the interview, I start to get a feel for where this person's at, how much they're willing to give um, for whatever reason right or wrong and figure out the best job for them within my organization. And, and sometimes it's not gonna work. If you can offer some flexibility in work hours or ability to work around family needs, um, obviously this last year with COVID, we've seen a lot more transition to um, remote work schedules or complete remote work schedules. Many companies are finding that it's a very successful productive shift, not always. But sometimes, you know, in, in many cases, it's over 50%. Um, companies are reporting higher productivity numbers. But I also say, look at your work, look at when the work needs to be done. If you're working with an employee or know you're going to be working with an employee that has different family needs or situations, see what you can do to work that out, work that out with them 
But whatever you decide you want to offer from a flexibility perspective, a work hours perspective, working around family needs, whether that means that an employee works at nine o'clock at night until 11 because they choose to do it, make sure you have an understanding and a written agreement that says, I agree to this, and I promise this, not promise, but you know what I mean. So um, always protect yourself from that perspective because this is where companies get into a lot of trouble um, when it comes to, well, my boss told me I could do this, that, or the other thing. And then the boss is like, no, I didn't. I never said that. So you wanna make sure that you protect yourself with at least documenting it, maybe have an agreement, something like that in place. And of course, remote options, um, You know, whatever remote options you can offer I used to before we went to the you know COVID protocols. You know, I had an environment where if someone had you know a sick kid or they had the furnace man come in, they could work at home for the day because it just made more sense and they could be more productive without having to like leave in the middle of the day or you know take a sick day. Those types of things. So that's going to be different for every person and every organization. But again, it's one of those things that you want to have a process or at least some type of procedure or protocol around that's well known to everybody within the organization. And then leadership and management um, is, this is the biggest part of employee engagement because you have to have an environment in which work gets done, there's trust, there's inclusion, there's transparency, there's open communication, and you want to make sure that um, your leaders in the company have the same mission and vision as you do and or whatever it is that you're establishing for your organization if you're you know still in startup mode building the company out and you want to make sure that you're putting the right people in the roles and so obviously you know culture starts with your leaders and you as the business owner top down you want to build trust and inclusion try to you know incorporate team building in a lot of different ways you can do it internal within your organization and frankly it can be as simple as you know, having a trivia hour or a happy hour, or you can bring in an expert that does team building and bonding within teams. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do it, but it doesn't have to be really complicated if you're just trying to build more rapport um, with the people that you work with, managers and employees. And I, I recommend that it be um, a full inclusive circle. It's not just, you know, employees and or managers, but you do it with both, you know, both types of, or both classifications of employees. Recognition, um, people like to be recognized. Um, sometimes as simple as a thank you is um, very helpful and can go a long way or saying, hey, you know, you worked a lot this week. It's Friday afternoon, three o'clock. You usually open until five. Why don't you shut down for the day? You've done enough. You know, thank you for a good day's, you know, good week's work. You know, you're done for the day, that kind of thing. So those little things can help. But you could have formal recognition programs. I mean, for my team, we have an MVP. We have a quarterly MVP and we have a quarterly values award. So in our organization, our values are people first. And so if we see and or get feedback from a client, a candidate, anybody about something that an employee did that maybe went above and beyond, um, they can be recognized for that. And then MVP um, in my world, I mean, it is still a sales world. So, you know, we look at, you know, productivity placements, those types of things. And then we give very small little rewards. It's not like I'm giving them a thousand dollars every quarter. I'm, you know, it's 50 buck gift card to wherever they want to go. And people like Starbucks and Chipotle. I mean, that's, it's not that bad, but it's the, it's the formal recognition among their peers and say, this is what this person did. And this is why they're the MVP um, it goes a long way. So, you know, try to do that and don't just promote people into leadership and manager positions just because, and I use the, the perfect example is, you're going to have or you may have a rock star salesperson, but that salesperson is a really good salesperson. Don't make them the manager because they're a really good salesperson. Um, I see that all the time and then they fail because they're not trained to be a manager. They're a salesperson. It doesn't mean that they can't be a manager, but you don't just promote them and say, OK, now you're the manager. You have to have coaching. You have to have training. You either have to develop it yourself. You have to bring in um, someone who's an expert in that area to do that for you. And you always want to have some type of feedback loop and some type of way of 
understanding what's going on in your organization. I highly recommend employees review their managers. Um, usually it's done confidentially. It can be done through some type of survey, uh, survey um, platform, but it's, uh, it's important that you do that for two things. One, you wanna make sure you're getting feedback so you, you may not be able to see every corner of your organization, so you wanna know what's going on. But two, you wanna also acknowledge it and make changes and address issues that could come up in those reviews. And so don't just do a review for the sake of doing a review, do a review of your organization at least annually and perhaps semi-annually for managers, for employees to um, review the management team or their individual manager confidentially so that you can get real information that can either help you train your managers better, fix an issue that might be simmering under the surface within your organization. And just as a side note for reviews, even with employee reviews, um, don't do an annual review if you can avoid it. Try to do them more frequently, more real-time data, feedback, review of goals, those types of things. Quarterly is a great way of doing it. Maybe do a formal review once a year and then informal quarterly check-ins with your employees. Um, but I highly recommend that you do that because then you're, when you're staying on top of everything, things aren't going to get missed or you don't discover in, you know, month nine that, um, you know, Joe isn't going to meet his goals for the year. And what does that mean for the organization? Those types of things. Oh, okay. So um, bear with me for one second, because I want to go back to my one slide that's out of order. So it's really important for employee engagement to always have ongoing and open communication. Again, survey your employees for feedback, survey your leadership teams for feedback. Um, terminate fast. So a bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. I've learned as a manager myself that oftentimes if there's a person on my team that's not performing um, and I wait too long to terminate them for whatever reason, oftentimes afterwards, I've gotten feedback from my own personal team saying that took you long enough or why'd you do that? Because employees can see when someone's not pulling their weight or not really doing what they're supposed to be doing. It actually brings down engagement and morale for everyone. And so, you know, obviously do your due diligence, make sure you terminate correctly, but don't let things simmer for a very long period of time because it's going to affect your whole organization or your whole team um, because of that one person. And then if people do leave your organization, try to do exit interviews. Either do exit interviews in some type of platform survey model where it's confidential and they can provide information, you're probably going to get maybe a 40% response rate to something like that better way to do it is on their exit of the organization, have a designated individual, HR, whoever it might be, someone who's going to be essentially considered unbiased or impartial, not someone in your department, not someone who is like close to whatever situation or that employee or the work or whatever it might be, to actually sit with them and ask them questions and get honest feedback. And then look at that feedback and then try to fix it if you can or address it as quickly as possible to always always be evolving and improving your organization and so with that slide out of order my apologies i want to say thank you this was a longer one um sam so i hope i didn't go over too much but um there was a lot to cover and i could still be talking but um that's the that's the overview of all of those areas no worries. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you for being here today in all three parts. We hope the audience was able to find uh, value in these conversations throughout the three weeks. As we have promoted on social media before, these sessions are recorded and can be referred to back again on our YouTube page. Just follow us on social media and we'll send a link for this one probably tomorrow or the following day. Um, with that being said, we do have applications still being accepted for our 2021 MWBE and Veteran-Owned Business Accelerator Program. Those applications do end. Uh, the deadline to apply is Friday, February 12th. So if you are a minority or women-owned business enterprise or a veteran-owned business, uh, you are eligible to apply. But if you know any businesses that um, are eligible in those criteria, please refer them as well. Um, with that being said, we will have future webinars coming in the next few weeks here. And Miriam, thank you so much for your support to Ignite You, 
sharing your expertise and your insights to our audience over the last three weeks. And uh, we greatly appreciate you and Alon's support to helping our local entrepreneurs and business owners in our community. So with that being said, I don't know if I missed anything, Mariam. No, I would just say thank you for the opportunity. I wish we could have done this in person. Hopefully in the next few yeah. months we'll be able to do that. But my offer stands to anyone and everyone if they just want to pick my brain or just want to have, you know, any type of help. Um, I, I, it would be my pleasure and my honor to assist in any way that I can. So um, thank you again for the invitation. Hopefully I can do something again in the future. And um, I wish everybody just amazing success. And um, hopefully I'll get to meet you soon. Yes, thank you so much, Mary. Everyone, thank you for joining in today. In the last three weeks, we appreciate your support as well. Don't forget to connect with Miriam and Alans on LinkedIn and other social media channels, along with following Ignite You as well. Everyone have a great week. Stay healthy. And thank you so much. Bye.